Well, thank you for um, joining us all the way through till the end of our um, fall membership meeting this year. Uh, it's been quite a remarkable meeting on several levels. Um, you may have uh, noticed or at least sensed that um, this has been a record setting meeting in several dimensions. Uh, not just attendees, but um, the number of uh, proposals for breakout sessions was far in excess of anything we've seen before. Uh, we, in fact, had to um, turn away a number of breakout sessions, although I hope you feel we did well with the uh, core of them that we, um, we offered to you at the meeting. Um, it was certainly a, um, the largest response we've ever had to uh, the executive roundtable uh, that we held on um, digital, supporting digital humanities at scale. Um, and uh, I'm just delighted that all of you could uh, join us for this event. Um, I've got a couple of things I want to do in this session. Um, first, I want to say a couple of thank yous. Then I want to say, uh, fill you in on something and say a little congratulations. And then I want to spend about an hour sharing some observations on themes and th events during the past year and how those are shaping and influencing some of our thinking about our program going forward and to highlight a couple of specific programmatic things we will be doing over the course of the remainder of the program year. I will aim to um, be sure that we have enough time for some questions on the end and that people get out promptly in enough time to make their uh, trains, planes, and other uh, conveyances. So first, by, the way, by way of thanks, um, I'd like to have you join me in thanking the huge number of presenters we had this year. I note that not only did we have a whole lot of sessions, but a whole lot of those sessions were in fact collaborations between one, two, or three um, uh, collaborators who worked together to put together um, uh, the coverage uh, that you saw in those breakouts. That's a lot of work, and um, these are, you know, really a, the core part of our um, meetings in many ways. They're about things that you are doing collectively, you're experimenting with, you're exploring. So please join me in a big round of applause for all those folks. <laughs> Second off, I want to say thanks to the CNI staff, which worked pretty hard to pull this meeting together. Um, it's been a big, complicated meeting. I'd like to thank, along with that staff, the AV team that has been diligent in trying to make everything work in an increasingly large number of rooms. And I also want to um, particularly thank the folks um, from the uh, University of Maryland iSchool who have volunteered to help out a bit with um, some of our um, breakout sessions set up in AV. Um, thank you all for uh, all of your efforts in making this run smoothly. And now for a little congratulation. Um, Many of you knew Paul Evan Peters, uh, the founding director of the coalition. Um, when uh, he died, one of the things that we did was establish a fellowship fund in his memory. Um, this is a fund that historically has gone to a, um, a graduate student in library or information sciences who um, uh, our award committee, which is which varies from year to year, uh, believes echoes Paul's um, interests and personality, not just in terms of um, excellence in um, service and in academia, but in a certain commitment to um, social good through information, um, to um, 
to making a difference in society through the availability of information and information services, and indeed also a certain sense of humor and irony in this. Now, we noticed in the last few years that this was almost invariably going to PhD candidates. And one of the obvious reasons for that is that they just tend to have a little more experience and a little more that they can um, point to on their resume than master students. Um, very natural sort of thing. But um, we were a little uncomfortable with this in the sense that um, we knew that Practitioners were every bit as important to Paul as um, scholars. Indeed, he, um, he went back and forth himself in his career as practitioner and scholar regularly. And so um, we were really delighted that we had the resources this year for the first time to award two fellowships, one um, for a doctoral student and one um, limited to uh, master's level recipients. Uh, this year, um, Jordan Esch Eschler from the University of Washington uh, received the doctoral award, and our master's level recipient was Olivia Dorsey from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Each of these students will hold the fellowship for two years, and then we will uh, have another round of selection. Um, I want to take a moment to thank the committee that worked through a lot of nominations and applications for these, and I think chose some really fine recipients from a very, very good pool. Um, those committee members were Ellen Burkowski from Union College, who represented EDUCAUSE, Clem Guthrow from Colby, who represented CNI, Jennifer Pastenbau from Brigham Young University, who represented ARL, and, of course, Joan Lippincott, ex officio. Uh, I don't know if Jordan or Olivia are still here. Um, if you are, stand and be applauded. Otherwise, we're going to just applaud anyway. Congratulations to you. OK. Let me get on to the main uh, part of the program. This, is, uh, this, is, uh, this covers a lot of material that I normally would cover in the opening plenary. And I have to say, this is one of the hardest talks I give uh, every year, because it, is, it needs to be wide ranging, but it also needs to be selective if we ever want to get out of here. Um, there are so many things happening now that are so interested and so complexly interrelated that um, it, it is really hard to thread the landscape. And so I'm going to make some observations, tell a couple of stories, and I am going to try and be selective. So if uh, your favorite key development isn't in here, think a little bit about how it connects up to the ones that I am nominating before you and um, uh, uh, how it might fit into this kind of broader program. The place I want to start is with security and privacy. Um, these have become absolutely pervasive kinds of issues. You saw in the opening plenary how much um, concerns about um, uh, security and privacy, particularly security, um, interplay with these notions of moving services onto the net and depending on remote organizations and remote uh, facilities much more than we have in the past. It's very important to realize that security and privacy are really separate things, although interrelated in complicated ways, and that privacy itself has become a very complicated, uh, multi-headed thing. Historically, a lot of it was about privacy from the state. Some of it was about privacy from one's neighbors. Now there is a vast, vast commercial enterprise in trading information about you, and some might argue uh, systematically avoiding, uh, invading your privacy. Um, those are different problems that call for different solutions. 
there are actually a number of people who are starting to think that we have dealt with many privacy problems a bit in the wrong way, in the sense that it's hopeless to keep information secret, and what you really should be doing instead is punishing people who make nasty uses of it, rather than uh, punishing the people who, uh, one way or another, fail to keep it secret. That's a very you know, interesting observation, which I think we will see play out in various areas. Um, there have been certain things I would characterize as um, you know, spectaculars in this area, which um, uh, raise you know, amazing numbers of questions. The Snowden revelations, um, those uh, you know, suggest a um, enormous breach of security in organizations that presumably are supposed to be among the best of the world at it and certainly are um, well-funded, shall we say, um, to try and maintain security. Um, some of the information coming out of there suggests that policy decisions were made um, rather systematically to um, undermine security in a lot of the national and international networking infrastructure, um, which, if it's true, and I think there is good evidence that th there's at least some truth in it, um, suggests that um, we've got a lot of work to do to strengthen that, um, that infrastructure. I think most people who um, look at security seriously um, are very skeptical about the notion of selective compromise, the, you know, the back door that's only used by the good guys and that the bad guys can never open. Um, somehow those seem to get opened by all kinds of people you don't expect and that's been true over and over and over again in the recent history of IT. Um, it is worth noting that the Snowden um, uh, breach also um, is kind of a uh, high watermark and a trend um, of another kind which raises all kinds of issues for archives and libraries and research collections. Um, here you have yet another example of a really large and untidy database of material um, this is not, you know, a short memo that somebody leaked out that everybody can read or the Times can publish on its front page and then it's well embedded into the um, cultural record. This isn't even something on the scale of the old um, Pentagon Papers um, from uh, the early 70s, uh, which was a pretty fat book of documents, but nonetheless a very tractable ex um, acquisition, which I would bet uh, still resides in many of the research libraries here, and is an integral set of source documents for people doing research in many aspects of um, policy, diplomacy, uh, military history, and related things from that era. Here we've just got this big old data set um, which is cached away in various places. Um, the government is still not real comfortable with this database to the point where, as I understand it, um, uh, it cannot be used as reference material in classes that are taken by government employees because they would be mishandling classified documents if they did their homework. Um, there, there are all kinds of strange things about this, but one, one wonders in this and a number of, six of, of predecessor disclosures of large corpora, um, what, how are we going to manage these kinds of really important caches of source documents and who is going to do it? Um, very, very interesting question. I'm not aware of any institution that's stepped up very clearly and said, we're going to deal with that because it's clearly a um, set of source material of very high consequence. Leaving that piece aside, you can certainly read about, you know, any number of other security and privacy problems um, in the press. I think one term that has become 
popular and is very unfortunate is the term data breach, which kind of suggests there's this event where the bad guys come in, they you know, bully, they break down the wall and carry off all this loot. Um, and, 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 you know, then you come and you put the wall back up and try and figure out where to, you know, track down the loot or minimize the damage. Um, there seems to be a lot of evidence that many systems are compromised now for long periods of time. Um, they're not just in there for a quick loot. They're in there to listen and find their way into more things and um, uh, to really take a much longer term um, look at what's going on. Uh, those, that, that, I think, is an important distinction and one to be mindful of. We seem to be, um, at least from what I read in the press, seeing a um, spectacular example of this with the Sony Corporation, um, where, at least the way I read the press accounts, they have basically lost control of their entire corporate IT infrastructure. And it may be they have to rebuild the whole thing from scratch to get any control over it back. It's that bad. Um, though this is unfortunately the new reality we run into. I don't think that anybody has, you know, magic answers about security and privacy, but I think that just as folks like the Internet Engineering Task Force in light of recent events and the new threat environment are kind of taking in inventory of a bunch of design cases and choices and going back and dealing with things that were too much trouble to get right the first time, uh, reassessing um, uh, uh, the strength of various algorithms and things, that we need to be doing this in our communities a little more um, systematically than we have. There's been some very good material coming out of EDUCAUSE's joint security efforts with, um, uh, with Internet2. Um, but uh, much of it is, is um, fairly broad-based. Uh, I think we have some particular issues about security and privacy that concern our community. Um, some of it's really easy stuff. Um, it's just, uh, why are we being sloppy and sending things in the clear when we don't need to, uh, when it's easy not to do it? Um, there are design choices that were made in, um, you know, and this is, this is sort of a systematic mistake that the internet has made since day one. Um, this underlying assumption that it's kind of a benign world out there, that who would bother to do this? Um, just as one case in point, it came to my attention recently that um, the whole um, infrastructure around the protocol for metadata harvesting who would want to masquerade as a repository and uh, inject bad data into um, the various harvesters there? Why would they do that? I'll leave the answer to that question to you as an, for you as an exercise. Um, I would just note that all of a sudden now we're using these as major sources for maintaining inventories of um, research data and things of that nature, and it really would be good if those uh, inventories were reasonably accurate. Um, the, f the, the hooks to do that kind of thing aren't in the protocol right now. Fixing this is not rocket science. It just needs to get looked at systematically. Um, we are going to be convening probably in February, the exact date isn't set yet, a smallish kind of semi-invitational, um, uh, semi-open meeting to start building a shopping list of these things that are particularly relevant to our community. Um, I think that it's high time to do this. A lot of this is easy and um, it, it's just appropriate to focus some attention on this. Um, there are two things that I would further note in this area that I think are harder and more painful to deal with. Um, and I don't know exactly what we do about them. One is the, um, uh, the sacrifices that we need to make in order to get licenses for certain kinds of material, particularly things that are predominantly consumer um, 
marketplace material as opposed to, say, the output of scholarly publishers. Um, if you just look at the sort of um, compromises that public libraries have had to make in order to um, be able to license material for their patrons, um, they're pretty uncomfortable in areas like privacy, and they should be. Um, uh, I'm not feeling real good about some of those. I think that it's combined often with um, uh, bad technology choices, but um, uh, this is an area where I think we need to, we need to really reflect long and hard. Um, and I think we need to do it across the whole culturally me cultural memory sector. The other thing, the last thing that I put on this agenda around privacy and security issues, um, or perhaps this call to build an agenda more accurately, um, is levels of assurance. Um, levels of assurance is basically an idea that says, you know, how rigorous do you want to be with evidence in trusting someone? So um, you, 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 for example, have identity credentials at levels of assurance. Um, some people will issue you an ID if you have a working uh, email box that they can send a message to so you can click and confirm it's yours. Uh, you've all seen that for mailing lists. Um, there are other IDs that people are a little fussier about issuing, you know, and they want to see you in person with your passport and your mother. Um, and uh, uh, you know those are those are heavier weight IDs that you can you can trust a little more. Um, one of one of the you know sort of great engineering observations is it's always easier to do this right the first time than it is to retrofit. The bad news is if you do it for right the first time, sometimes it takes forever and the whole system is overtaken by events. Um, or by something that doesn't do security nearly as well. But um, I, I'm struck that we are now building a whole new apparatus of author identity, of factual biography. We've seen you know, little things around the edges, some experiments in verifiable citations. So when someone claims they published this in that journal, you can check it out easily. Um, but there is no agreement, I think, and indeed little discussion about what our expectations are of the system, whether, um, whether we want things to be strongly verifiable or whether we're going to basically assume that people are telling the truth and the, um, uh, you know, the people who don't will get outed eventually when they um, overreach. Part of the problem here is um, trying to understand how widespread what problems are. You know, it used to be that the perception was that um, uh, plagiarism was not much of an issue in the scholarly literature. Now, um, most major publishers uh, share a database that they actually use for automated plagiarism checking um, as part of their uh, editorial processing um, uh, workflow. What do we believe about this new world of um, you know, factual biography and author identity? Does this need to have a high level of assurance? Or um, are we just going to assume that basically almost everyone is friendly enough um, to, uh, that we should, we should take them at their word? So those are a few places specifically around security and privacy that I just want to take note of. Um, I, I will say that particularly in the commercial sphere, it is stunning how much we don't know about how personal information is passed around and resold. Um, and uh, um, there's a lot of work to do just understanding what's happening in that area. I will come back a little later to just one more aspect around privacy and security in the context of human subjects and research data, but bear with me as I uh, push on here. So, Another clear trend is that um, we are really genuinely pretty serious about research data management at this point. Um, 
we are still waiting eagerly and um, I think with growing impatience for some of the policies to come out of the federal agency, funding agencies that actually tell us what the ground rules are going to be in implementing the uh, OSTP directives about access to federally funded research outputs. But meanwhile, um, in the kind of broader context, we're seeing a um, genuine focus on data, data sharing. Big data is, you know, one of the fashions of the month. Um, uh, many of you probably had an opportunity to see Phil Bourne here in the one o'clock slot today or in other venues. He was appointed earlier this year as the first um, assistant director for data science for the whole National Institutes of Health. And I think um, the creation of that role was a, um, you know, another underscoring of how important they are recognizing um, data management and research data to be. Um, and they, of course, are, you know, building on a long and um, visionary history that goes back to the uh, work of um, particularly the um, National Library of Medicine in um, the 1970s and beyond. Uh, but you're seeing this in other government agencies. You're certainly seeing this in business. Uh, one of the uh, developments I've watched with considerable fascination is um, city governments getting very interested in big data to run better cities and the emergence of a series of um, academic centers in what I could only describe as urban informatics fundamentally that are working in close partnership with their host cities uh, both in the United States and abroad. I think there are um, some very, very um, important things that are starting to happen there. Uh, share, I think now, um, which is going to be, from my point of view, um, I think kind of a backbone inventory and analytic tool for um, understanding um, research data responsibilities within the research and higher ed sector, I think now has got a relatively clear vision of where it's heading and um, is starting to move along. I think that will be significant. There's still so many things that we aren't coping with very well in this area, though. Um, Data involving human subjects continues to be a huge problem, and I'm not sure we have got an effective conversation framed yet between those who come to the issue in terms of human subject privacy and dignity protection and those who come to um, it from the view of what we can achieve if we can genuinely share and reuse data very freely. Uh, we're looking for ways to advance that conversation. But I want to tell a story that um, I keep coming back to and turning over in my mind because um, uh, it's just so amazing at so many levels and it illustrates a number of fault lines that are developing here. We've talked a little bit before about how there's a whole sort of alternative universe of social science that's evolving out there in the commercial sector. Um, people doing experiments and studies that you could never get away with inside a university. But nonetheless, studies that I think um, they sleep well at night having done and where they have been genuinely re respectful and thoughtful about privacy and impact, just not framed the same way that our traditional IRBs in academia frame them. So some of you probably know the story, but you should all know the story. So sometime earlier this year, I think it was late spring or thereabouts, the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science publishes a paper. Now, this is a paper that is jointly published by um, some researchers at Cornell and some folks at Facebook Research. And here's the basic idea, if I've got it right, at least in a nutshell. There is this theory um, called emotional contagion. And sort of the short version of this is that if your circle of friends keeps telling you depressing stuff all the time, you will, you will probably tend to reflect depressing stuff back to them. 
Um, there's a, there's a sub-theory that says that some people flip the other way and get um, aggressively cheerful when surrounded by depressing stuff, but they're, they're sort of outliers. So th this is the general um, theory, and someone came up with a brilliant idea that, hey, we could test this on Facebook. And actually, we could get a pretty big, it, the, the speculation is that it's a reasonably subtle effect, so that um, in order to get a big enough sample size to tell you much, um, uh, uh, you've got to get a lot of people in the, te in the experiment. So what these guys did, as I understand it, is that they um, twiddled the algorithm to, um, that, that makes up your Facebook feed to bias a bit towards depressing kinds of postings. Um, and in order to figure out which postings were depressing, they did a little sort of light um, computational sentiment analysis. They then looked at what people were sending out who were on the receiving end of this depressive bias um, uh, feed and uh, did the similar sentiment analysis on there to see if um, they were trending a little depressed. And if my memory serves me, uh, they did this to something like 60,000 people. Drop in the bucket for Facebook, you know, not even a serious experiment, but huge by the kind of numbers that the academic world generally thinks in terms of. And um, they actually found that there was a little bit of truth in this. So that was the experiment fundamentally. And this paper came out and people started just freaking out in various directions. There was one set of people, um, mostly academics, who said, Where, what IRB allowed this? Was there even an IRB in the loop? This is outrageous. Where were the 20-page uh, informed consent uh, forms every time you logged on to Facebook? Um, uh, um, just you know, this sort of reaction. Then there was another group that said, you know, actually this seemed pretty harmless. If you think about it, it's not um, really a good experiment to do with informed consent for various reasons, because um, it, it kind of undermines what you're doing. And um, it's not really a very dangerous one. There's no evidence that, you know, people were jumping out windows, their feed was so depressing or something like that. Um, and that this actually should be, you know, viewed as a pretty clever experiment, then we ought to think about other things we should do like this. And of course, like most ethics debates, um, this really hasn't been resolved. There are people who I think have made very cogent and articulate cases on both sides of it. Um, there are people who I think are quite legitimately worried that things that are normally product optimization in industrial settings um, may now be kind of reframed potentially as human subjects experiments um, with enormously destructive effects to a lot of industry, although there are also people wondering if maybe we don't need a little regulation in some of this. Um, as a side note, uh, you know, I, I had an opportunity this fall to attend a conference at MIT on digital experiments, um, and hopefully they will get around to putting the video from this up, and I will share it on CNI Announce. But um, I can guarantee you that at least 90% of you here, while you've heard these sorts of ideas about A-B optimization on these large services, you know, where you think, um, well, if I move this from the left-hand corner to the right-hand corner of the screen, I'll sell a few more things or something. And you probably know that um, companies like Amazon and Google regularly do kind of live testing of tweaks to their interfaces and algorithms where <coughs> they just assign, you know, one out of five for one out of 50 users coming in to get the new thing and then look at behavior. That's been well known for years. What's less well known is that um, they're not doing A-B testing anymore. They're doing thousands and thousands of tests a year 
with incredibly complex statistics to measure and avoid crosstalk and cross interference between these tests. They run these tests for a very, very long time, sometimes looking for um, uh, pretty um, low level effects, which if you add them up over the scale of the system, turn into real money in the course of a year. Um, you know, it do doesn't take much um, optimization to uh, make 20 or 30 million dollars a year. Um, this, this is way down in the decimal points. Um, so there's a, there's a huge industry in this, but um, here's the part of the Facebook thing which surprised me the most and, and worries me the most in some ways. Um, there were a lot of unhappy people who were Facebook users. And the reaction there was, how dare you mess with the Facebook feed algorithm? Why that you know, was handed down perfectly um, somewhere in the distant past. And they don't understand that actually, you know, there are a thousand engineers at Facebook who are fiddling that algorithm and running 20 different versions of it every day. Um, and uh, the only thing that's different here is they're not trying to optimize on an objective function of more dwell time so Facebook can sell more ads. Uh, the, it, it appears that, you know, one of the things that this incident really put a spotlight on is how little people understand the extent to which their interactions with all kinds of things are shaped and personalized by algorithms in random and non-repeatable ways. Um, this popped up in another context recently. I had an opportunity to join a discussion that was hosted by the Reynolds School of Journalism out in Columbia, uh, Missouri, on preserving the news. And um, one of the things that people don't realize is how personalized news has become. Uh, if all of us go to the New York Times, I assure you we're not all going to see the same page. Not even close. So the notion of what it means to preserve web pages of whatever kind in environments that are intensely personalized and where in fact the personalization algorithms are under you know, rapid experimentation and evolution and evaluation um, is a very serious and intellectually complicated problem which I think we're going to see showing up um, in, in many different contexts. It's also one that I think deserves some attention as we think about what are the important points these days to be stressing in terms of information literacy and understanding your information environment. So, um, you know, that incident I think begs a hundred things. It, it, it asks questions about reproducibility of results. It asks questions about what's appropriate ethically, um, where business trade secrets fit in. Um, it, uh, it raises questions about what kind of evidence we should be collecting to support future research in these areas. Um, I think it's a very salient kind of example of some of the challenges around big data research. We've also started some conversations and there was a very helpful um, uh, clear workshop um, uh, that uh, took place on Sunday that probed this matter a little bit about um, things that we have in our archives and special collections that need to be restricted in some way or that are in very ambiguous status. Um, very good examples are materials collected, let's say, before 1900 where certain uh, present day norms about collecting data, um, how to do anthropology, things of that nature, simply weren't in place. And, um, you know, telling somebody that well, that would be regarded as, you know, probably unethical research that could pass a review board today um, is very problematic. This is the only research we got about some of these things and the only research we will ever have on some of these um, lost civilizations and places and things. 
Um, we have to talk about these things and what to do about them, um, no matter how awkward it is. And I was just thrilled to see that complex of issues starting to surface. Let me move from there, though, and talk about another one of these sort of adjacent areas um, that are very troublesome as we consider these issues around digital science, around reproducibility, around what to do with research data management in the long term, and that's software. Um, we often, you know, make this kind of casual set of statements about, oh yeah, software preservation, software sustainability, big problems, got to do something about those. Um, well, we do got to do something about those. Um, I think it's time to really take a much closer look at what's going on in some of these areas and what the impacts are. I think that there is massive confusion right now about what sustainability means, the difference between sustainability and preservation, what it means to preserve software, and I think actually there are probably about five distinct and more or less separable uses of that term preserve that seek to accomplish different things. Um, it's really time, I believe, for a bit more nuanced um, uh, analysis there. I think this also ties into some phenomena that we have a very poor grasp on and that we touched on in the opening conversation in the context of enterprise and other large-scale software. And that's about rates of obsolescence and change. Um, in some sense, it's very desirable to always keep everybody on the current version because if you're, a, if you're developing that software, it's easier to deal with only one version in the field. It's easier to introduce changes if you're kind of automatically keeping everybody up to date. But the flip side of that is that particularly when you look at the commercial world, um, vendors in various positions have um, enormous motivations to put people through what are frankly at best unproductive um, cycles of very short-term forced obsolescence. I believe that there, you can make some support for a hypothesis that says that open source software does better with this. Um, if you look, for example, at the back compatibility of um, something like uh, Linux, I think that there's some evidence, although there are people who know much more than I do about this and these things are hard to quantify, that they've done a pretty careful job of back compatibility. Uh, I would contrast that to, um, uh, oh, for example, Apple which has just gone almost crazy in the last couple of years on these very, very aggressive short cycles of um, forced obsoles obsolescence, which um, uh, cause a lot of collateral damage to the broader software environment every time they do it. Uh, all of the applications that somebody needs to find money to rewrite. I think we need to understand things like these um, forced obsolescence cycles and what they imply for tool selection in areas like digital humanities, um, where there's not a lot of money to rewrite everything every year, or even indeed in the sciences. Um, what difference they make to our various kinds of preservation and sustainability strategies. Uh, we've seen a set of new tools starting to emerge in this area based on virtualization technologies. Um, there are a couple of fascinating um, uh, projects that try and approach software preservation through emulation. Um, uh, uh, Rothenberg's old dream actually genuinely sort of come true. Um, I think this is an area where it's high time to really look at what's going on. Um, I don't, th and, it, and it is also coupled to this movement of things to the net that we opened the, um, opened the meeting by talking about. So that's an area that's on my mind and that I hope we can explore together a bit during the coming year. 
we, as I mentioned, did a um, did an executive roundtable here on digital humanities, and um, you can look for on supporting digital humanities at scale. You can look forward to a report on that sometime in the coming year. And um, I do want to note that we just launched uh, shortly before this meeting quite a deep set of um, web pages that go with a summary report that was included in your packets dealing with the role of digital scholarship centers, which is something that Joan Lippincott has been leading an investigation of for some time. Um, these are very closely linked, I think. Um, it seems clear that various kinds of diffusion and support centers, um, digital scholarship centers, more faculty-oriented and disciplinary-oriented um, uh, digital humanities centers in some cases, um, these are all important mechanisms for diffusion of information about technology and methodology among faculty. Uh, they seem to have a particularly key role in um, digital humanities, although their use now is extending much wider than that in some cases. We're going to be doing some follow-on work there, I believe, in the coming uh, program year. Uh, one of the things that was striking, and this is often the case when we pull together a workshop, is um, we asked the people who were coming to the workshop on digital scholarship centers to complete a brief form saying what they were doing and um, uh, uh, how long they'd been doing it and things like that so we could get some sense of the sorts of projects represented and those are all available on um, the web pages dealing with the thing. But we got a lot of requests in that had the general form of we are thinking about this, looking at it, planning for it, um, trying to decide what to do about it, et cetera. And it would be really helpful for us to be able to sit in on the discussion and learn from the folks who are already deep in. Um, we decided that we would turn those folks away from the actual meeting in order to keep it small and have the discussion we wanted to have, but um, provide them the report and the other information from the centers who were, the scholarship centers who were represented there. Um, and I think that will be very helpful for those folks, but there seems to be a good interest in, a good deal of interest in going forward and looking at some form of workshop that is for institutions who are trying to plan such a, um, such a center to um, try and help them identify the key choices and planning parameters, the success factors that have worked for others and things like that. So we expect we will be doing some kind of an event, um, very possibly, can, although this is not settled yet, connected with the spring CNI meeting, which will look at this and provide an opportunity to engage planning issues around such um, centers rather than operational issues for those who've been there for a few years. We also recognize that um, there are a lot of things that have the word center in it. Um, and actually, they are widely varying in character and purpose. Um, there is no right answer. Um, at least unless you put me in charge of terminology and I can just make, um, you know, sort of uh, um, arbitrary decisions. There's no right answer to what is and isn't a digital scholarship center. But we think that it might be a real help for people who are trying to do things in this area to at least summarize the points of disagreement and the different kinds of things that are parked under these headings so that when we have conversations about them going forward, we can be clear about which conversation we're having and do a little less talking past each other or lengthy definitional negotiation before we can get on with things. Um, that one, if we go ahead with it, um, will probably be a smaller event. Um, uh, and um, 
uh, we'll invite a few people who've had some deep experience in there and try and produce a relatively succinct document with some examples that will just facil facilitate conversation in that area. This whole question of you know, how we diffuse technology and new research methods, um, which seems to be so heavily focused on the humanities today, um, keeps coming back again and again. And um, I think it's really important that we try and get some better handle on what's going on here. Uh, I want to close by talking about a sort of a big strategy thing that I've been thinking about for a few years and I've touched on before. And if you've been going to the right sessions here, you will see a number of sessions that help advance this agenda in various ways. So here's my sort of fundamental um, thesis without getting into a lot of detail. If you ask the question, how are we doing in terms of preserving and providing stewardship for the, our cultural memory in the society broadly? So that would subsume, but not um, that by any means uh, be limited to the scholarly record. It includes um, culture, art, um, records of government, a whole lot of things. Uh, many, many of which serve as evidence for scholarly investigation. If, if, if you just ask the question, how are we doing on this? Nobody can answer it. They can maybe answer it for little sub-pieces, but not even there the answers are poor. Um, if you ask the obvious follow-on questions, are we doing better this year than we were last year? We have no idea how to answer that. Um, or here's a really salient question. I agree we need to do something about this and we're not, going, we're not doing as well as we should. How much would it cost to do 50% better than we're doing now? We have no idea where to even begin to answer that question. But these are questions I think we need to start getting a handle on. And there have been some kind of point investigations in there, like the excellent work of the Keeper's Registry and related activities about who's archiving what scholarly journals and what scholarly journals are not being archived. The studies that Columbia and um, Cornell did on uh, what proportion of their periodicals were in fact archived, um, that was very helpful. Um, at this meeting, we had a report um, uh, on some studies that are being done of digital-only music. And the short bottom line on that right now is, other than copyright deposit into the Library of Cong Congress, uh, we basically have no mechanism to get that material into any of the institutions that are concerned with the cultural record. Very bad. Um, in mass market books, you see a very similar kind of problem emerging. We know that we are in a um, unfortunately less and less slow motion train wreck um, dealing with the audiovisual materials of the 20th century. Um, the equipment is mostly gone, the memory of the formats is going fast, uh, the actual media that the stuff's written on is busy rotting away. This is a big problem, um, a big and urgent problem. But it's not a problem until recently that we could get much of a handle on other than, well, it's really big and it's really ugly, um, which is not a persuasive pitch to make to a donor. Um, this is going to require some big infusions of funds in the interest of cultural memory. And if we can't provide some pretty good ballparks, we are at a vast disadvantage. Indiana University a couple of years ago took a pretty systematic inventory of their problem. This was big. It was 
ugly, it was expensive, and they actually were successful in winning a sizable down payment on the problem from the leadership there. Earlier this morning, we had a report from New York Public, um, which is a very special kind of institution because of where it is and its ability to raise funds um, uh, in the whole context of the New York business and cultural community. They've, they've, they are just completing and sharing results there. Their numbers are bigger and uglier than Indiana by a substantial portion, but I think that it is a huge contribution to be able to quantify the scope of this problem, and I um, sincerely hope that they are able to take the next step from there to mobilizing resources to deal with it. At the Q&A in that session, um, other institutions indicated that they were starting to uh, move on this front. And actually, one of the good things that's starting to happen now that we have a couple of stakes in the ground is some of the methodological work is more stable. So um, uh, getting, to, getting those surveys done is getting a bit easier. Those give us some sense of um, the scale of the problem in various areas. Um, the work that OCLC research is carrying forward um, at, for example, their workshop tomorrow on the evolving scholarly record and the boundary points around there. Um, the conversations about research data management, all of these are parts of understanding this, um, this collection of problems. The discussions that we've touched on here and in other venues about what does it mean to preserve the news, for example, in the digital world. Um, all, all of these are part of a very broad agenda of mapping and trying to measure the scope of the preserving and providing stewardship for the cultural heritage. Um, and cultural memory um, enterprise. I hope that in the coming year, we are gonna be able to feature some more important sessions there, draw your attention to other work that's taking on, that, that's going on in that sphere, perhaps identify some additional um, uh, problem areas that could use some attention. Um, uh, NYU has done some very good work in recent years about um, the, con the video industry, consumer video of various kinds. Um, I suspect there are horrible things waiting to be discovered if we look at video games of various sorts, and there have been some preliminary uh, investigations there, although I think they, they have probably been more focused on the difficulties of handling individual video games as opposed to um, dealing with this problem in the large. Um, some of this is further complicated by the fact that a lot of these industries, everything from the news industries to the book publishing industry, are getting um, viciously restructured along various lines with mergers, uh, failures of, of companies of long standing and other sorts of things that keep changing the landscape and challenging our ability to even get good basic statistics about what's going on so that we can do the kind of analyses that folks like Keepers or um, Cornell and Columbia have been able to begin to do around scholarly journals. So I would just leave you with that as a kind of an overarching challenge that you will be hearing more about and uh, hopefully seeing more insights in. I think thinking about it in that systematic way is a helpful thing to do um, as a way of kind of coordinating, measuring, and prioritizing our um, collective work in uh, meeting our social needs in this area. So those are some of the things I think you can expect to see increased function and in some cases some specific actions on uh, from the coalition working, of course, in partnership with many other organizations and ultimately, of course, in partnership with our members uh, to advance. That's about all I want to say today. I would be very happy to take a couple of questions on 
our program going forward, things we have been doing, things we've not been doing, or thoughts on other developments that we haven't touched on. So thank you for listening, and the floor is open. Takers, there are microphones there. Ah. Ah. Oh, well. Thought we had a live one there. Um, no takers, really? I would have thought there was somebody in there, something in there that must have uh, worried someone. Um, okay, well. It has been a very, go for it. Thanks Cliff and thanks for a, a, a great overview of the um, program for the next year. Um, in the opening plenary, um, which touched on some of the topics you just mentioned, um, there was a lot of, uh, there were some questions from the audience around uh, preservation, um, some of the risks involved, and you mentioned some of those. What are your thoughts on the or risks of organizational preservation related to the other preservation issues we're uh, dealing with. And then attached to that, I'd just like to know your thoughts about open source as an exit strategy uh, in association with those uh, chances of organizational failure. Um, those are both great questions. So knowing that something is open source as an exit strategy is something that leaves me feeling better than not having it, but not a lot better. Um, it's a little bit like there's a, there's a similar pattern that was used for commercial software going back into the 60s and 70s called source escrow, where the idea was that if your um, application software provider went broke, um, uh, you would be able to pop open this um, safety deposit box and Hopefully there would be some reasonably current um, uh, source code in there and maybe even some documentation and you would be able to go forward. It's, it's kind of a lot like the open source model except that you don't get to inspect whether you've really got an adequate source base until it's too late to do anything about it. Um, so the open source model is clearly superior in that sense. Um, and there are ways you can deal with the escrow thing where you have third party audits and stuff like that, but it gets, the transparency of open source is really kind of nice in that sense. Practically speaking, uh, most institutions who have been running something on a hosted network app where somebody else has been taking care of everything for the last five years, and that suddenly goes away and they have to stand up the open source code in another facility, um, are probably in really deep trouble. They don't have the expertise internally to do that. They don't have the deep knowledge and experience with the code to figure out how to provision hardware for it and optimize that. Um, uh, they are at a big disadvantage. Um, sometimes they can work their way out of that disadvantage, usually by spending a lot of money rather rapidly. Um, if, for example, the company goes bust and you can hire up three of their lead developments to deal developers to rehost the code at your place, you've got a significant advantage to not knowing anything about it and having to learn it. Um, but I do, I do see it as sort of a um, uh, expensive last resort in most cases for these big complex systems. Um, the business of institutional vulnerability and failure is one that has been a lot on my mind lately because um, going back to these, these sort of structural comments about the cultural record, one of the things that seems to be true is that there's a lot of culturally important material parked here and there in um, companies or other organizations whose business models are falling apart. So just take the case of newspapers. Now, um, there used to be a lot of newspapers in this country. 
they used to be a ton of local newspapers. Then people started buying them up and um, basically minimizing the amount of local news in them. They lost their advertising revenue uh, to Craigslist. They, um, uh, they lost market share to television and the web and other sorts of things, and they went broke. We have enormously fewer newspapers in this country today than we did 20 years ago. All of those newspapers had not only back issues, which mostly were parked in um, libraries, so we've got those, what was published, but they have very deep databases in the form of morgues. Um, see, remember, the news used to be a very parsimonious thing, right? You'd send out a photographer, you'd take 20 photos, you'd publish one, and the other 19 go in the morgue for possible future use. Now, you send somebody out, you take 20 photos, you put one on the front page or in the print edition if you're still making one, and then say, click here for more photos. Um, so all of those um, archives, um, most of them, and there are some fascinating exceptions, got lost when the newspapers failed. Some of them ended up on eBay. Um, we are very bad at transferring assets, particularly out of corporations, into cultural memory institutions at scale and under serious time and economic pressure. Um, indeed, um, we don't even necessarily have clear ideas of um, uh, whether this is appropriate behavior or whether they should be putting it up on eBay as part of the bankruptcy. Um, and we could talk about a lot of other examples, but that's just one of them. I think this whole business of transitions of stewardship is a very, very key problem that requires some real close attention. I've been looking at a couple of case studies um, over the last year or so, um, but uh, to me it's starting to emerge as one of the kind of systematic challenges we face here. You know I can't resist building on that one, Cliff. So uh, you just nailed it, the systematic cha uh, challenges there. Uh, Catherine Skinner, Educopia. With the newspapers as an example, and just probing that a little bit uh, more deeply, one of the things that, that I've noted and that I've heard you note in multiple settings is how challenging it is to get the right people around a table mm -hmm. when the right people aren't all in the same field or mm -hmm. even in the same connected set of fields. So do you have any advice on how to address some of these system-wide problems, like the failure of news and the failure of our preservation of news, which are intertwined, but that involve stakeholders that include the journalists themselves who have been disempowered, the local news owners, who some still exist, but not very many, and they've mm -hmm. been disempowered, uh, the conglomerates, which don't know what to do with newspapers, mm -hmm. they're not making money off of them, so they're shoving them aside, plus the libraries, the public libraries. I mean, it, yeah. it's a swirling system, and I'd love mm -hmm. to hear you speculate on how to start to address that. Well, I mean, obviously it takes collaborations among multiple players. Um, what's really hard here is that you need convening um, or organizations that can convene across an incredible um, array of places. You know, the Library of Congress, for example, just by virtue of you know the brand of the institution, has some substantial convening power, but um, not in some of the areas you name. Um, so we we clearly are going to need um, we're, we're going to need groupings of people. I would really love to see um, uh, some outreach to people who are involved in um, uh, corporate leadership and governance um, who have an interest in some of these things to start framing them from that perspective. Um, you know, people who are on the boards of directors of newspapers and presumably as part of their governance role are trying to do some balancing of, of corporate and private interests in some cases. Uh, we need people you know, at that level to be part of the conversation. And um, some of that in, terms, in turn, I think, um, uh, presents us with a huge challenge in 
talking about these problems in a way that is accessible and clear to the thoughtful general public and that doesn't get too far down in the weeds. Um, uh, it's very dangerous to let this, um, I think, careen over into narrowly legal discussions when really this is much more a discussion about um, you know, what sort of a culture we want to be, um, uh, which is a different kind of conversation. And we need, I think, to uh, really seek ways to do that. Some of them maybe are going to have to return to um, uh, some very traditional kinds of thinking about getting messages out through um, various kinds of campaigns. Remember the films that um, Clear did in the, um, I guess probably the 1990s now, Slow Fires? Um, I think that those were, you know, quite legitimate and somewhat effective efforts at communicating some of these issues. Maybe we need to do things like that. I don't know. But um, clearly the, the convening, the scope and breadth of the con convening challenge here is really huge. I think people are about ready. I think planes are calling. Let me wish you safe travels. Let me thank you for joining us and thanking you for your support of the coalition. Um, hopefully I will see many of you in Seattle and I suspect I'll see many of you in other venues between now and April. Have a very good uh, holiday season and end of the year. Thank you. <laughs>